We're going to look at this psalm and we're going to approach it in this process uh, by the will of God of pulling down strongholds and casting down arguments. We're going to use this psalm to answer a question. Psalm 111, this is uh, the word of God. Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. He has declared to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. May the Lord add his blessing uh, to the reading of his uh, word. So say, I want to use this psalm this morning to answer a, a particular type of uh, difficult uh, question. It's a question that can come in uh, many forms. It's a question that's a favorite amongst the experts who like to rubbish the Bible or who are quick to condemn God as some kind of uh, cruel monster. It's a question that may be accompanied by reference to the expert's uh, favorite Bible verse or two, Uh, usually verses that have something to do with the slaughter of the Canaanites uh, in the Old Testament. Um, Joshua 6 and 21 is a favorite. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city both man and woman, young and old. Or another favorite, Numbers 31 and verse 17. Now kill all the boys and kill every woman who has slept with a man. The expert may bolster his question with some highly helpful uh, statistics, some shocking facts even. Uh, to his thinking about the Old Testament. One of these experts gives these three particular uh, nuggets. Number one, there are roughly 1,000 verses in the Old Testament in which God himself kills one or more people. Number two, there are another 600 verses where God commands or permits wholesale massacre in battle or number three uh, here's the clincher in this expert's mind this is his favorite if you add all those killed by God using the flood sent in Noah's day that total would rise to 20 million men women and children I'm not sure where he gets the figure of 20 million from but it's certainly a large number 20 million Innocent men, women, and children. Our expert, of course, doesn't actually believe these things happened. It's all a myth. God is a figment of silly people's imagination. It's that kind of, there is no God, but I hate him anyway, kind of atheism. You may well have that, your own version of the question in mind. Yes, it's a question that the skeptic relishes to ask. But it's a question that also troubles Christians. And there is no short, simple, soundbite answer. 
uh, so loved of our modern impatient world? What is the question? Well, I'm just going to put it this way and say you could put it lots of different ways, but I'm going to put it this way. How could a God of love slaughter all those innocent Canaanite men, women, and children? How could a God of love slaughter all those innocent Canaanite men, women, and children? To answer that question, I want to look at this particular psalm, Psalm 111. And I want to say three things by way of uh, answering this uh, question. Three things to do, as uh, say Paul uh, told us, to pull down strongholds and cast down arguments that are contrary to the knowledge of God. Three things by way of answer to this important question. The first thing is this, the works of God are holy. The works of God are holy. This psalm is very much a celebration of all God's works. His works of creation, yes. His works of providence, yes. But particularly his gradually unfolding plan of Salvation, the salvation of God's elect, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in every age. And here the, the focus, is, focus is on that stage in the plan being worked out primarily in the Jewish nation in Old Testament uh, times. God's works are holy. Verse, verse 2, the works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. Verse 7, the works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever, and are done in truth and uprightness. Just in those few verses, there are at least 15 reasons why all God's works are perfect, why they are the right thing done at the right time for the right reason. If something's important to say once, if it's even more important, we repeat it, but 15 times, it must be very important. And the point is being made here by the psalmist. Evidence is being piled up on more evidence. It is beyond all question or dispute that everything God does is perfect. Let me just quickly run through the list that we have. The works of the Lord are great. And of course, they are supernatural. They are miraculous. God's works are to be studied. Well, of course, they're designed to be instructive. Uh, God's works cause pleasure. Well, they are a joy to study. His work is honorable, worthy of God. His work is glorious. God's works reveal his unchanging character. His righteousness endures forever. God's works are wonderful. God's works are to be remembered, not brushed under the carpet, no, bet, no bits best forgotten about. The works of his hands are verity, promises made, promises kept. The works of his hands are justice. God's works confirm that all his precepts are sure. Is God sure that was the right thing to do? Yes, God is sure. God's works stand fast. They are undeniable. They are unforgettable. God's works are done in truth. God's works are done in, righteous, uh, in uprightness. Here's a whole avalanche of evidence to prove that everything God does is perfect. But of course, everything God does must be perfect because God himself is perfect. And God's actions are the perfect revelation 
of his perfect character. As the psalmist puts it in verse 9, the Lord is holy and awesome. Well, let's take the awesome bit as, as read. Let's look at the fact that God is holy. God hates sin. In Habakkuk 1 and verse 13. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. God hates sin. It's as simple and scary as that. God hates sin. God is holy. And the holiness of God, it directs everything he does. It explains everything he does. And it justifies everything he does. Everything God has ever done, everything God is doing, everything God will ever do is perfect. Because God is holy and he is to be praised. Psalm 99 verse 1. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. And then verse 5. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Everything God does is perfect. Done according to his holy character. Brings him glory, deserving of praise. And this is especially the case when it comes to God's plan of salvation. This, after all, is his greatest and most glorious and most awesome work. And here in our psalm, uh, the psalmist praises God for his plan of salvation. And he uses language appropriate to his day. Uh, verse 4. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. He has declared to his people the power of his works. We'll come down to verse 9. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. See, these verses highlight the fact that all God's works take forward and advance his great plan of salvation. And of course, when we, we see that word redemption, the price of freedom, or of course, it can only lift our gaze uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has redeemed us, the one who has paid with his precious blood. God's great plan of salvation is worthy of praise. Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6 God has chosen you to be a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Praise God for his saving grace. Or 1 Peter 2 verses 9 and 10. We are his own special people who have obtained mercy. Praise the Lord for his saving grace. According to God, all his works exalt his holy character. Everything he does advances his great plan of salvation. A plan to save a people for himself from this sinful, fallen uh, world. Nothing that you or I or anyone else for that matter can say can tarnish God's reputation or call into question God's character. The idea that you or I might have an opinion on anything to do with God, well, that's just bonkers, isn't it? The idea that I could embarrass God, the idea that I could make God squirm a bit on the, throne of the on the throne of the universe. What mind-boggling arrogance. I should be ashamed to make such a fool of myself. It would be laughable if it wasn't so insulting to God. I should bury my head in shame and cry out for forgiveness. 
the big picture, all the works of God are characterized by holiness as he works out his great plan of salvation. And then coming to my second point as we look at this uh, psalm. The second thing that we see here is this. The judgments of God are praiseworthy. The judgments of God are praiseworthy. This psalm begins with praise in verse 1, praise the Lord. It closes with praise. Verse 10, his praises endure forever. And as I say, in between are all those works of God deserving of praise. Then, today, and for all eternity. And note carefully that those works include his works of judgment. Because that is, what of, uh, that is part of what verse 6 tells us to praise God for. Verse 6, he has declared to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. Here in, in one verse, we have a, a broad sweep over a, a great swathe of history. Uh, God's rescue of his people uh, from the land of Egypt, his gift to his people uh, of the promised land, or as it was, Canaan. The land of the Canaanites was God's heritage, a gift handed down to those upon whom he had set his love, taken from those who perished under his judgment. We're told here that the death of the Canaanites is a display, verse 6, of the power of his works. Canaan, of course, was a, a beautiful land, a land flowing with Milk and honey, we're told in scripture. A pros uh, full of prosperous cities engaged in trade uh, all over the Mediterranean world. But it was also a land overrun with false religion. There were numerous impressive stone temples. There were countless open air shrines and altars everywhere. They uh, enjoyed fertility rituals all kinds of sacrifices and so-called sacred sex. There was worship of Baal, god of rain, worship of Shaphash, the goddess of the sun, and so many others. There were idols of wood and stone everywhere. And of course, the, the Canaanites had their own sacred books to reveal more to them about the gods and to uh, guide their worship. The more I think about the ancient Canaanites, the more I see similarities with, well, let's say modern India, for example, another land full of idols and idolatry. That would be a, for a sermon on, a, uh, on mission. The Canaanites then, when we look at them through the focus of scripture, we find that scripture speaks much about the horrendous crimes and atrocities they committed. Canaanite religion and all the sin that went with it was an abomination in God's sight. Uh, they even went so far as to burn their children in the fires. Deuteronomy 12 and verse 31. They burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Of course, yes, we should be rightly sickened at such a practice, sacrificing children to their so-called gods. But of course, there is only one ultimately who is worthy to be the supreme judge of the Canaanites. For as we're told in Genesis 18 and verse 25, God is the judge of all the earth. That judgment, like God's other works, was carried out in keeping with his holy, sin-hating character. The verdict of God's court is recorded for us in Hebrews 11 and verse 31. It tells us there, the Canaanites perished because they did not 
believe. The Canaanites, to some degree, knew the truth about God, but they rejected him nevertheless. How many Canaanites in total perished? Well, Scripture gives us only limited details by way of actual uh, numbers. Uh, For example, we're told this about the city of Ai, and it was by no means the largest city, but we're told this, uh, Joshua 8 and verse 25. So it was that all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai. For the capital offence of worshipping false gods, guilty as charged. Men, women and children, we, we don't know the total number, perished at the hands of this holy, sin-hating God. Those already lost to idol worship and those who would otherwise grow up to continue that sin. God hates sin more than you or I can ever possibly grasp. And the greatest sin of all is to reject God in favour of other uh, so-called gods. As one uh, commentator uh, puts it, idolatry is everywhere represented in scripture as the greatest insult the creature can offer to the creator. Man's religions have been his greatest crimes. How much does God hate false religion and all the sin that goes with it? We'll just look at his judgment of the Canaanites. That's the message. That's the lesson for us to learn about God from those verses that are quoted with such relish but such little understanding uh, by some so-called experts. In the light of verses like that, I can do nothing but bow down and worship this awesome, holy God. Who am I to do anything else? A sinner saved by grace. I can only be amazed that a God who hates sin that much has not judged me as I deserve. I can only look at Calvary and marvel at the work this sin-hating God did there in order to save me. Let us genuinely, passionately, humbly, thankfully worship God for all his awesome works. And of course, at the very forefront of that worship will be our praise for God's most awesome work of all. John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When we think about the severity of God's judgment on the Canaanites, there's something else that's very important uh, to remember. That was a small-scale judgment, if I can put it that way. That judgment is only a forerunner of the final judgment that is to come, when Christ will judge all who have not believed in him. If there were tens of thousands of men, women, and children who, who fell under that judgment in the days of the Canaanites, if there were millions fell under that judgment in the days of Noah. Well, it's going to be billions, isn't it? On that day when the Lord returns. Because the final work of judgment belongs to Christ. John 5 and verse 26. For the Father has granted the Son authority to execute judgment. What will it be like to face Christ on that day? Well, some smart Alex 
have brazenly suggested that they will give their judge a right telling off when that day comes. No. Revelation 6 and verse 15. Every man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Again, it's clearly set out in scripture, this final judgment will reflect God's holy, implacable hatred of false religion. And sin in all its manifestations. Um, Revelation 9 verse 20 speaks of the people who worship idols of gold, silver, brass and stone and wood. They will fall under that judgment. Revelation 9 verse 21 goes on to speak of people who commit murders, sexual immorality, thefts. They too will perish under that judgment. But note also... There is a personal responsibility to repent and seek God's mercy before this judgment falls. Because the God of all grace will save all who will repent without exception. For this judgment falls not on those who will have repented and trusted in Christ for salvation, but on Revelation 9 and verse 21. The rest of mankind who did not repent. You see, such is the mysterious, unfathomable, sovereign grace of God. A great host, easier to number than sand grains on the beach, will be saved. Will enjoy the presence of their Lord and Saviour forever and ever in heaven. And how will these redeemed people of God respond to this great work of judgment on the last day when it is completed? Revelation 19 and verse 1. After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honour and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. Or Revelation 15 and verse 3. They sing the song of the Lamb saying, Great and marvellous are your works. Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For your judgments have been made manifest. On that great day, the response of the redeemed gathered together in heaven will be one of praise and worship to God. And that will include praise and worship for his judgments. Your judgments have been manifest. The people of God will praise. They will, yes, they will praise Christ as their saviour. O king of the saints, they will shout uh, about their so great salvation. But they will also worship Christ the judge. It cannot be any other way and it will not be any other way who shall not fear you O Lord and glorify your name here are difficult texts in the Bible yes in the sense that they may be too difficult for our uh, tiny sin clouded minds to understand but at the same time there is nothing difficult about these verses in the sense of calling into question the character of God, as if somehow they're evidence of a black mark against God. No. All that God has done, all that he is yet to do, the judgments of the Canaanites, all of these glorify God. They are the acts of a holy, sin-hating God. They are part of that great unfolding plan of salvation. 
uh, Acts 13, in Acts chapter 13, Paul speaks about God's plan of salvation and he lists a whole series of links in that unfolding plan. Acts 13 and verse 19, one of the links, God destroyed the land of Canaan. And then another link, a few more links on in the chain, verse 23, God raised up for Israel a saviour, Jesus. The judgments of God are praiseworthy. And then just thirdly and finally, the blasphemers of God are ignorant. The blasphemers of God are ignorant. Ignorant often, yes, in the sense of being downright rude, but more particularly here in the sense of being completely in the dark, totally unqualified to pass comment. And ignorant in the sense also, I think it's fair to say, that they come to the Bible with their minds already closed, their minds already made up, their enthusiasm for quoting certain Bible verses, well, it's nothing more than a very unattractive, self-righteous indignation. And, of course, they even feign surprise at those of us who are so stupid to disagree with them. A few years ago, a very high-brow magazine uh, featured a series of interviews with some of the world's leading philosophers. Uh, one of them goes under the title of Distinguished Research Professor of Philosophy. He is also uh, an atheist. And during the course of the, his interview, he gives his answer to all the usual uh, questions. Can you prove God doesn't exist? Would the world be a better place if everybody was an atheist? Etc., etc. And he gives all the usual pat answers. He, when asked about faith, he compares faith in God to faith in the Loch Ness Monster. But the most interesting question that was put to him was this. What, if anything, will, con will convince you that there is a God? What, if anything, will convince you that there is a God? And his answer? Well, in my opinion, this is the only question he answered correctly. Here's what he said. I doubt if anything could convince me via reasons and reasonings that there is a God. To which he added in that condescending way, beloved of those who live in the highest of academic towers, of course, a blow on the head or something similar might mean I end up believing anything, however outlandish. He's absolutely right about one important thing. Nothing by way of reasons or reasonings will make him believe. Because nobody is neutral on this matter. Everyone's mind is captive to something. On the one hand, captive to your own or even Satan's thinking. On the other hand, captive to the word of God. A blow on the head, as he puts it, certainly won't work, as he puts in his rather condescending way. No, that will never work. What is needed is a supernatural work of regeneration in the heart. An arrogant, hostile denial of God, replaced with a humble, thankful worship of his glorious person and all his awesome works. An entirely new way of seeing God and seeing yourself. Or as our psalmist puts it here in verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all those who do his commandments. Or in a nutshell, as our Lord put it to another highly regarded professor in his day, John 3 and verse 7, you must be born again. Here in 
this psalm in verse 111, we meet some of these people saved by God's grace who delight to praise him and who rejoice in all his works. We actually meet a congregation of them for it's the special joy of God's people to gather together and praise him. Verse 1, praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great. His work is honorable and glorious. Each one believes that all God's works are deserving of his or her wholehearted praise. Praise with all my whole heart. Only the highest praise will do. Can we praise God for his judgments on the Canaanites? The psalmist did, verse 1, praise the Lord. So must we, verse 10, his praise endures forever. But they're words to be uttered, not at the top of our voices, not as if we're part of some baying mob looking for blood. No, not at all. Those words should be uttered softly, reverently, with a trembling voice and a tear in your eye. Because we acknowledge that this is the work of God, whose every action is perfect, whose every work is praiseworthy. And because we know in our hearts this same judgment ought to have fallen on us long ago. If you are a Christian, don't insult God by being embarrassed or ashamed of anything that he has done. Don't let that known Christian put you on the defensive, as if you think, you know, God must have gone wrong somewhere, it's just you won't admit it. Don't give the impression to an unsaved world that there are somehow dark recesses in the Bible that are best forgotten about. No. Isn't all of God's word enlightening? Psalm 119 and verse 130. The entrance of your word brings light. If you are not a Christian this morning, well then you know only too well that there is absolutely nothing that I can say by way of argument or reasoning that will make you change your mind. What can I say to you? Well, I can simply ask you to do this. Rather than use the Bible as a supply of ammunition to shoot down God with, ask God to reveal his real self to you in scriptures. Because as Paul says in 2 Timothy in verse 3 and verse 15, the holy scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen.